So I'm incredibly excited for us to have our last session of the year for our fifth annual Minority Mental Health Awareness Summit. And I'm excited to have our two presenters here that are going to be sharing about allyship and youth mental health. And I'd also very interested for them to share a little bit more information about the organization that they represent, Minding Your Mind. So without any further ado, you both have the ability to share your screen and I'll let you take it from here. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so my name is uh, Jordan Burnham, and um, I am from Minding Your Mind. I am a young adult speaker from Minding Your Mind. I'm also the director of training, so I am in charge of being able to recruit new speakers, train them, and also develop the current ones uh, we have now. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Melissa actually introduce herself now before I get started. Sure. Thanks, Jordan. And thank you, everyone, for holding this. We're so happy to be here. So again, my name is Melissa Harrison. Um, I am a clinician uh, with Minding Your Mind, so I'm a licensed professional counselor in the state of Pennsylvania, and I um, help facilitate mental health presentations with mental health, and today I'm acting as a support to Jordan and Jordan's presentation, you know, at Minding Your Mind as a clinician, wanting to use my platform to continue to go out through the world and try to destigmatize the messaging about mental health. But especially, you know, wanting that message to be inclusive and cross-sectional, um, as we know that there are um, many boundaries that marginalized people have to overcome to get the right care um, in this country, particularly the care that they deserve, um, and also trying to always be um, inclusive in my education and a disruptor, especially when I'm in um, spaces of whiteness, um, as I go out into the world and, you know, not in just these sort of forums, but go out into the world and speak about mental health education. Um, so I'm going to be like sort of a, the sidecar of this presentation, but obviously here to support Jordan and also just answer general questions about mental health. All right, so I will go ahead and um, let's see, share my screen because this is uh, life now. All right, so uh, my name again is Jordan Burnham. Uh, for, how rude of me. First off, welcome to my living room. Um, <laughs> my dad's Penny and Lily. We're always happy to host and, and have company, so welcome. Um, so as I said, um, I've been speaking for Minding Your Mind uh, for, uh, I guess this will be 12 years now, of being able to go around the country to speak to young adults in uh, middle schools, high schools. Um, and so the thing with my presentation that I want to do today is to give a bit of my personal perspective, but then also have a wider um, conversation, especially when it comes to mental health for people of color, um, and specifically for me being in the Black community, what that looks like and what I've seen over the years of being in uh, mental health advocacy. Um, so I will start my story off with where I'm originally from, uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So growing up, I had my mom and dad who both worked in school districts and then my uh, sister, Tara, who's five years older than me. Um, so growing up, my sister and I actually got to attend a private school because that's where my dad worked. And it was great because it was a small school. Everyone got along. It was like being in one big family. But in third grade, my dad gets a new job, meaning now we have to go from private to public school. And I was thinking the transition would be an easy one, right? I'll get there, I'll gain new friends, I'll fit right in. But I get there, couldn't have been any more different. Uh, I was made fun of for the way that I talked, the way that I dressed. I was told that I talked too proper, that I dressed too preppy. Uh, so I got picked on. I got beat up by this one kid whose name I won't say because that would be petty and unprofessional, Stacey Evans. And so when I got home at the end of the day, I wasn't sure who to talk to, but I would talk to my sister because she was going through the same type of problems, the same type of issues. So when I got home after school, it's like my sister became my therapist and I became hers because she could relate to everything I was going through, vice versa. Uh, and that's how we became close, best friends, going through elementary school and the middle school. Now, besides talking to my sister, I got by with three different things whenever I was going through a tough time, you know, these being my healthy coping skills. Uh, first is sports. Love to watch, love to play sports. Played basketball, baseball, uh, but to this day, my favorite sport, my best sport is golf. Uh, the second thing, I was always the class clown. Love being able to make people laugh. And the third thing is I've always been a social person. So I like trying to meet new people, gain friends and start friendships. 
which gave me a little acceptance that going into middle school, I finally felt comfortable in my environment. You know, the people around me, the friends around me, but seventh grade comes around and two major things happen. The first was my sister goes off to college and I was happy for her. I was proud of her. She got an academic scholarship to go to Penn State University. Now, even though I was really happy and proud of her, that's my best friend leaving. I don't know who to talk to now whenever I'm having a bad day. Who's gonna be that one person I can go and vent to? I don't have my best friend anymore. Uh, the second major thing that happens is that my dad goes to interview for a job at a high school outside of Philadelphia. So he gets offered that position, he takes it. And in the middle of seventh grade, I have to switch schools again. Now I was hoping this time it would be different. You know, I'd get there, I'd gain friends, I'd fit right in, but I get there and it's pretty much the same thing all over again. You know, made fun of for the way that I talked, the way that I dressed. The main, the, the biggest difference though, as far as my transition was that I was going from a school in Pittsburgh that was probably 70% black, 30% white. And there really wasn't um, th that much diversity between the two. But then I was going to the school and at that time when I got there, it was around 5% black uh, students. So for me, that was the first time being in a classroom where I was the, the only black student in the classroom sometimes. You know, and in that moment, even though I'm only in seventh grade, when I'm the only black person in that classroom, I feel as though I have the weight of the entire community on my back. So I have to represent, I have to make sure that it seems as though I belong. You know, I think kind of thinking to what uh, a lot of people say today, black excellence. I, I always felt like I had to be that and show that in order to just feel like I was okay being in that classroom and just being in that school. But the main difference outside of even just that is that my sister wasn't there at the end of the day to talk about what I'm going through. So this was the first time I kept any depressed, lonely thoughts to myself. I didn't talk about it. Um, we had a school psychologist at our middle school. You know, she had her own office. You could go there whenever you wanted, but the kids who were going to see her had lost someone close to them. Um, their parents were going through a divorce. So I didn't know I could just walk in and say, hey, I'm just having a bad week. Can we please talk about it? So I shot away from her office. But going through seventh and eighth grade, I was able to tell jokes, play sports, gain some friends, that going into ninth grade, I was voted class president, which is something I should have been really happy and proud of. But at the same time, I feel like I'm in a community, but I'm not really a part of one because I'm going to school with a mask on my face, you know, hiding the fact that I feel depressed, I feel lonely, and I feel like I don't belong. I'm going to school with fake smiles, fake laughs. So I figured the people around me that call themselves friends, maybe they were fake too, because they didn't understand the true me, the true Jordan, and what I was going through. But I get to high school, get to ninth grade. But ninth grade was a, a weird transition for me. So it was the first time I started doing a lot of different things. It was the first time I started trying to impress and please other people instead of just making myself happy. So dressing a certain way, hanging out with certain groups of people, going to parties just to fit in. Ninth grade was also the first time that I started to drink. And I didn't drink just to get drunk for no reason. I drank because that was the one time me and my guy friends could talk about something real other than girls or sports. That was the first negative coping mechanism I picked up while I was in high school. Because as a guy, I would never talk about my feelings or my emotions while I was sober. You know, I would never talk about feeling sad or feeling depressed while I was sober. But as a guy, I felt like I could open up and talk about anything while we were drinking, especially by the time we were drunk. So I thought that was the only way to express or cope with whatever I was going through. Ninth grade was also the first time that I started to see my grades slip. Couldn't figure out why. Why I can never pay attention in class. Why I felt like I was 10 steps behind everyone else. And I lacked motivation to even get up and go to school, but I couldn't figure out why. But 10th grade comes around, and that was the first time my parents said, we think you should go see a therapist. And I remember the first time I entered a therapist's office, I was very judgmental because I really didn't want to be there. And so I'm, I'm in this room and I'm looking around the room and 
looking at this woman sitting across from me and and in the back of my mind I'm thinking how could she ever understand what it's like for me a 16 year old black male going through high school why would I ever share through my thoughts my feelings when she could never understand or relate to me especially not like my sister could it took time to not only find the right therapist I switched twice that year so I finally felt comfortable with who I was talking to um, and even once I found the right therapist, it, it still took at least two or three months for me to get used to talk therapy. You know, having someone help me process my mental health issues was just something I wasn't used to at that point. But that year, I was 16, I was diagnosed with depression. I didn't know what that meant because I didn't know what the difference was between feeling depressed and now actually having depression. The best way I can explain it is that anyone at any given point or time can feel depressed. But more times than not, that person knows why they're depressed. So maybe it's the anniversary of something very saddening to them, going through a difficult time in school, going through a bad breakup, you know, any and all things global pandemic related. But that person knows why they're crying. They know why they don't feel like themselves. They know why they're depressed. But someone like me who has depression, I could wake up one day and have no idea why I feel so sad, why I don't want to wake up and get out of bed, why I'm crying for no reason, depressed for no reason, why the simple tasks like brushing my teeth or taking a shower seems so hard to do on certain days. You know, it's not whether I'm going to wake up having depression or not, it's just what level am I on emotionally because of my depression. One or two is saying, I feel so low, I'm thinking about suicide, taking my own life. Nine or 10 is saying today's a good day, but what's tomorrow going to be like? I had a very negative, pessimistic way of viewing the world once I was diagnosed with depression. I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want to be judged and I didn't take it seriously. You know, I was prescribed medication, but I wouldn't take it on a consistent basis. Um, I would lie to my therapist to get out of her office as quick as possible. And I was still using alcohol as an outlet to talk about whatever I was going through. Uh, and that's something that really, you know, affected me in a negative way going into my junior year of high school. Because that year I struggled a lot. Uh, at the beginning of the year, it was academically because of all of this pressure that I put on myself to be perfect in every way when it came to my grades. I also went through some problems and issues with my girlfriend at that time, with my friends. And I get to a level four or five. So not necessarily thinking about suicide or having a specific plan but just questioning what life would be like for other people if I wasn't here. So that year, middle of my junior year, uh, my parents were told I needed to go to a behavioral hospital. And I remember on the ride there, I'm thinking there's gonna be padded walls, guys in straitjackets jumping around, but we pull up and it's a regular building. There's no padded walls, no one is in a straitjacket. It's guys who look like me, dress like me, but going through way worse problems than I was. Guys were 14, 15, addicted to any drug you can name, already considered alcoholics, belong to gangs, have seen family members, friends, die right in front of them because of gang violence, have been physically abused, excuse me, since they were children. And here I am because I'm messing up in school and problems with my girlfriend and my friends. You know, I figured there was no reason for us to be in the same room, let alone the same building. And I voiced this during our first therapy session and I remember once we had done, uh, the therapist took me to the side uh, and he said to me, you don't need to minimize how you feel based on the severity of other people's problems. And what you're going through, your experience is valid, just as valid as the person sitting next to you. Now you came here to learn how to cope with your mental health issues in a healthier way, not compare them. And you know that made sense to me. Because even though we were all there for different reasons, and even though their problems seem way worse, bigger, more complicated than mine, we were handling what we were going through in a negative way. Now, the most important lesson I learned being in that hospital was that we can never choose the bad things that happen to us in our lives, but we can choose how we cope with them. And I'll never forget that week of being in there. You know, the patients or names or stories, the therapists I got to talk to, Emotionally, mentally, I felt strong enough to go back to the real world, go back to my junior year. But I get there and it's a terrible transition all over again. Main reason is because I was safeguarded for 
from anything that could harm me emotionally while I was in that hospital. So now I'm exposed to all my stressors all at once, but I feel like I don't have an outlet to talk about them. So I fell right back into this mist of depression saying, why talk about how I feel when no one truly cares or understands? Junior year was also the first few times I got caught drinking by my parents. And right before my senior year started, my parents went off on a trip, uh, throw a party for me and my friends. We're drinking, we get drunk, party gets busted by the police. And I have to call my dad to tell him what happened. And I'll never forget that phone call because I've never felt so guilty as his son. And I'm telling him, dad, I'm so sorry for letting you down yet again as your son. So when that should be making you happy and proud, all I do is disappoint you. This time it felt 10 times worse because my dad is the athletic director at my high school. I put his job in jeopardy. There are people at the high school that wanted him fired because of my mistake. So I took the weight of all of that. I put it on my shoulders. And by the time my senior year started, I was constantly having suicidal thoughts, not questioning whether I would do it or not, but going through a checklist of, well, if I did, how would I do it? So I make it look like an accident. And the one thing I said over and over again was I don't necessarily wanna die, but the part of me that has depression, I want that part to die. The part of me that feels sadness, guilt, I want that part to die. And I would go to school and I would listen to what, you know, I call the depressing playlist. And there were songs that talked about suicide, feeling depressed, sad, angry, and I'd play it at the loudest volume. So even if someone yelled or screamed my name, I didn't have to hear it. I just wanted to be numb to the world. But the one good thing that happened beginning of my senior year, I was making playoffs for golf and that's something I was excited about. So my dad picked me up from school that day. Uh, and I get there and I play one of the best rounds that I played all year. And I'm so excited to get back in the car and tell my dad all about it. But I look over at him and he looks really sad. So I asked him, dad, what's wrong? He says, nothing, I'm just tired. And I can understand that. He works at a high school, it's late in the day. I can understand why he might be a little exhausted. So we get home when I reminded him, dad, my car's at school, we have to go pick it up. He said, no, just go upstairs, mom's waiting for you. And I started to panic because my parents and I didn't have that type of relationship where they would just be waiting for me upstairs to see how my day was. We didn't communicate to that level. So I get upstairs, I look at my mom, she's on the couch and she looks like she's about to cry. So I asked her, mom, what's wrong? She says, nothing, I'm just tired. Now my heart starts pounding, questioning, what did I do this time to upset my parents yet again? That's when my dad walked in with a duffel bag full of alcohol that I had hidden in the trunk of my car. When he dropped that duffel bag in front of me, that was it for me in my mind. Because here I am, their son, and all I do is disappoint them, make them angry, upset. I can tell by the expression on their faces, they don't even want me to be their son anymore. What's the point in being here? I can't make my mom, my dad, my sister, if I can't make anyone happy, What's the point being here? That was the night that I attempted suicide by going out of my nine story bedroom window. When I hit the ground 100 feet below, I broke my left fibula, I broke my left tibia, I shattered my left femur, I broke my pelvis, broke my jaw in four different places, I broke my left wrist and had fractures to my skull. When I was flown to the hospital that night, I was induced into a coma for five days. I mean, I was in the ICU for two weeks, and I still don't remember one moment of being in that ICU. But I remember when I finally came to and I realized I was in a hospital, I was just trying to figure out what's going on. First thing I noticed is this feeding tube going down my nose. I touch my throat, there's this tube, this trach in my throat, so I can't talk. I literally have no voice. Uh, still rods coming out of my left leg. Uh, my left wrist is wrapped up like I'm about to go into a boxing match. IV in my arm, hooked up to three different monitors, and I have no idea why I'm there. To this day, I don't remember going out my window. I remember everything else leading up to that event. I remember my physics class that morning, every hole of golfing that day, the car at home with my dad. But going out the window, I just don't remember. 
that. And this was impulsive. I didn't plan my suicide attempt. That was a Friday that started out just like any other Friday of high school. I didn't wake up that morning thinking, this is the day I'm going to attempt suicide. But for whatever reason, when my dad dropped that duffel bag full of alcohol, there was something in my brain saying, I don't belong here anymore. One night, my sister was visiting. And to this day, Tara and I remain very close, best friends. So I knew if there was one person that would tell me what happened and be honest, it was her. So one night, it's just us two in my hospital room. And I look over at her and I mouth to her. Uh, because of my uh, the trach, I couldn't talk for two and a half months. Uh, so I mouth to her what happened. And she looks at me and she starts to cry and she says, you went out of your window. There were so many thoughts and questions in my head, but the first is, that's impossible. I wouldn't survive a nine story fall. Even if I did, how drunk was I to accidentally go out the window? Did someone drug me, push me out of my window, what happened? She said, no one was in the room and you were completely sober. The words in the thought suicide attempt didn't even come into my head at that point. Because yeah, I knew I had thoughts of not wanting to be here, questioning what life would be like for other people if I wasn't here. But I never thought I would go through with those emotions, with those feelings, not to lay in this hospital bed with no one else to blame but myself for something I went through with. Um, and in that moment, I was willing to accept uh, two things. One, physically, my body would never be the same after a nine story fall. You know, that's just the reality of falling 100 feet and the injuries that came along with it. There's nothing I can do at that point to change that. Uh, second thing was that this was a suicide attempt. And I think by being able to accept both of those things, it helped me with the next decision I had to make while I was in the hospital. Because while I was in there, my dad gets an email from a reporter from the Philadelphia Inquirer newspaper asking if he could interview me. And I remember when my dad walked in my hospital room and basically described this reporter as being a nice guy and asked me if I would do this interview, if I would tell my story for the first time. And I said yes, almost immediately. Because at that point, I'm the 18 year old senior in high school, supposed to be running around with all my friends, enjoying my senior year. But at that point, I'm the 18 year old senior in high school and I'm down to 80 pounds. You know, I can't move, I can't talk. I had been told by doctor after doctor that I would never walk again, that I would never get out of a hospital bed. So I figured by literally spelling out every single word of that interview on an alphabet chart, people on the outside of the hospital can touch the words I don't have a voice to say. So whoever reads this article, whoever hears about this story is never in the position that I'm at right now lying in this hospital bed. And when the story came out in January of 2008, uh, feedback was incredible to hear feedback from people who thanked my family uh, for sharing this story. Uh, but at the same time, this isn't how I pictured my senior year of high school, something I look forward to from day one. Um, and I was able to graduate on time with the rest of my class uh, and even walk a graduation using a walker. Um, but I'm always honest in saying it's still tough to look back at that senior year, knowing that's something I can never get back due to the repercussions of my suicide attempt. But it's been It'll be, I guess, what, 13 years uh, this September since my suicide attempt. And from the time I did that interview, the reporter's name was Michael Vitez. By the time I did that, e e that interview, um, I thought that would be my first and last interview that I did. Um, I didn't think I'd share my story again because, you know, when I did that interview, I was 18. And in my mind, I thought there's no way that, you know, my story can relate to enough people to the point where I'm still sharing it years from now. Um, but I, I was looking at it the wrong way because what, the way I should have thought of it is I didn't realize how many other people were affected by mental health issues, mental health disorders. And because of that, it allows me this space to be able to educate, to hopefully inspire, to hopefully motivate people to not only speak about their mental health, but also to be able to speak on it. Um, my favorite thing about using my voice is that it allows me to hear the voices of so many others. Um, and so that's why even today, as I continue to speak and share my story, I feel just as passionate as I did my very first presentation in uh, October of 2008. And um, I feel great being able to not only be in a position to share my story, but be in a position to also amplify other voices and allow others to share their stories as well. Um, 
So one of my, actually one of my last in-person presentations, uh, my wife got to be at, and um, I asked her if she had any feedback. And the only one piece of advice is that I didn't include my coworkers that I get to work next to every day. So um, I'll make sure I give them a shout out. So we got Lily over here on the left, who's the uh, OG of the family. She's 10. She's probably my favorite person to work next to because she's either doing this where she's comforting and her support, or she's doing what she is right now, which is snoring. Um, and then we have Penny over here on the right and Penny just turned two. Ball of energy, love her. Likes to interrupt a lot of my presentation in Zoom meetings. So that's, um, you know, my, my parents and I have a much better relationship when it comes to me opening up about my mental health, allowing them to be a part of my support system. My sister Tara, like I said, I, I consider her my best friend to this day. Uh, next to her and her husband, Dan, we now have my niece, little Madison, who I just got to see this past weekend. And uh, she is five going on 15. And then little Huddy, the reason why I got to see everyone, it was Huddy's birthday, he just turned three um, on uh, Sunday. So even though I'm grateful for all of these things, uh, whether it's my family, my wife, our lovely cats, my job, you know, what I get to do today, my support system, I still have to take care of my mental health. You know, it's not like depression's a cold that goes away after a couple weeks after taking some medicine and, and seeing a therapist. Uh, it's still something I deal and cope with, but deal and cope with in a much better way, especially than I did before, you know, the suicide attempt. Um, I still see a therapist on a regular basis. I still take medication on a daily basis. Uh, there's a whole wide range of tools that go into how I cope with my depression today. And I'll just go through these quickly so we can uh, hopefully have some questions in, in conversation. Uh, but the first, uh, journaling. I love journaling. I don't write pages upon pages because I'm good. Um, I usually just write a short par paragraph of here's what happened today. Here's where I am scale of one to 10. Um, and if I am struggling, I like to write down how I cope with it in that moment. Maybe who I talk to, what music that I listen to, what um, you know, video game that I play, what TV show, movie, because I like to not only be reminded of what I've been through, but also I like to remember how I got through it. So I like being able to journal for that reason. Uh, FaceTiming with my friends, try and do that as much as possible. Sims 4, uh, my wife loves, like loves Sims 4, but then she got me into it. So that's what we do now is we get to compare our builds and talk about the characters we've created in our worlds. So that's, um, that's our marriage. NBA 2K, I don't think I play too much, so we can skip over that one. Um, exercise, um, usually, I can't do a ton as far as like physically, physical ability. I'm able to walk around today, but it's not like I'm able to go running or you know run up and down playing basketball. But what I do love to do to this day still is play golf. I love being able to go for a little walk whenever I can, even do some things in the, the living room. Exercise is something that's not necessarily easy or something I, I always wanna do, but I try and incorporate that for my mental health as well. Uh, meditation, I do a, a five minute meditation in the morning just to get my day started listen to all different types of podcasts and record podcasts for reminding your mind as well. Um, and listening to rap music too loud. Um, I got in trouble. I got in trouble for, cause um, when you have to do like a morning presentation, it's, you want to have some type of energy going into it, especially when it's like eight 30 or seven o'clock in the morning. And so um, occasionally I would listen to some rap music just to, and it, it wasn't the clean version, so that probably didn't help. But uh, in, in the first few months of being at home in the quarantine, uh, everyone at the apartment complex got an email uh, that we need to be mindful of the volume of our music in the morning. Um, I knew who said it too. Like, I'm not going to say anything because um, we're cool. Like, her and I are cool because she has cats, I have cats, and that's the, but like, she plays her jazz music as loud as possible in the afternoons. I guess everyone's cool with that. So because she plays Art Tatum, she's cool, but I play any rap music and I'm the, sorry, <laughs> been holding that in. Anyway, so um, as far as, you know, my story and, and you know, again, doing what I am today, um, you know, the way that I, I look at it now is that there, there were so many opportunities as far as reaching out to someone, whether it was a teacher, whether it was a school counselor, whether it was a teacher. Um, one of the things looking back that I wish we did differently at my school um, it, it's a culture thing too, especially each school I go to is very, very different in the way that they talk about mental health. Some schools, the students talk about it. There's a club even for mental health. There's even the, more than one school counselors. 
it's great to know where their office is and other schools, they just don't talk about it because either one, it's not necessarily priority or two, also sometimes it's, you know, it's okay to admit that there are still issues we have as far as resources with certain schools and being able to provide that for students as well. Um, what I wish we did differently at my, my, you know, high school and even middle school was just normalize the conversation, not just of mental health, but about coping mechanisms, but about like meditation, about mindfulness. I wish that we learned who our school counselor was. My school psychologist in high school, if I said her name at the next high school reunion, whatever that is, if I said her name to all of my friends that I graduated with, no one would have any idea who we were talking to because uh, she was never introduced at a school assembly, never talked about, just did not know she was there until my junior year of high school until I got back from the behavioral hospital. So looking back, what I wish we would have done differently was just normalize even a conversation with the counselor, seeing them on the good days, which it ups the odds as far as me going to talk to them when I'm on having a bad day as well. Um, so that's what I, I wish, you know, from a society standpoint, I guess, in a school standpoint, I wish we did differently. But um, as far as, you know, sharing my story today, and I do want to, you know, also speak on what this year and a half has been like mental health wise, uh, I'm just gonna, for, for black, I'm just gonna say for my black experience, what it has been like. Um, you know, uh, for me, it's great to be able to uh, use my voice, like I said, and it's great to be able to hear other voices. But one of the things and the, the reasons why I was so motivated to, even if I didn't love hopping on Zoom, even if I, I didn't love initially just getting that adjustment period of trying to translate my story from a stage or a classroom to sing in front of my computer. Um, what motivated me to, to share my story so much during this time period is because more than anything, representation means so much uh, to so many people of color, uh, to so many marginalized communities. And whenever I have the opportunity to be able to be a face, to put a face to mental health, especially in a community where, and I always push back a little bit whenever um, I'm asked the question, you know, why don't black people um, talk about mental health? Because, uh, you know, I started saying that we do talk about mental health, we just don't talk about it in the same venues or um, what would be typically thought of as places to talk about mental health. Because when I go to church, I hear people talk about depression, I hear people talk about mental health issues, I hear people talk about alcoholism, addiction, but it's just not being said in a therapy group. It's not being said in front of a therapist or a psychiatrist. Um, when I go to the barber shop, the, the conversations that I have with my barber, with the people that are in there, there's just some really deep conversations sometimes. And sometimes it's just really great conversations to have a community that I trust, that I can go to and I can laugh with, ask questions and, and life questions and life stories, all those things. You know, having a group support system is something that is incredibly valuable um, but maybe it's just not looked at in the same way because of being, again, in that community. Also, this is intergenerational. Uh, not only just the trauma, but the lack of resources, um, the idea and the thought of going to see a therapist or a counselor. It's not something my parents were taught. Uh, my parents were taught, you know, what happens in this home stays in this home. And, you know, to expect my parents to already know exactly what to do when it came to seeing a therapist when it came to medication and a lot of it, it was an education and learning process. And it's still something that I think we all are going through is learning and understanding as we evolve. Um, and so that's another reason why I always just feel passionate about sharing my story, because I never had that. I, I never had a black, my, I only had one black teacher that was fifth grade, um, love her to this day. I never had a black teacher in high school. My dad was an athletic director, but outside of that, there were no staff. Um, that I could talk to and I could go to and talk about how I was feeling. Um, always, always school counselors in middle school, high school, elementary school were white. So having someone come to my school and talk about mental health was something I didn't have, but having someone come to an assembly and talk about their experience and especially talk about mental health was something I never even thought of would be possible and was available. And so that's the other reason why I want to make sure that I do this is because I do want to be the face and the voice that I never really had when I was in uh, middle school uh, and high school too. Um, so uh, I know I went on a little long there, but I, I just, um, whenever I have the space to uh, speak on this subject, I never take it for granted. And I always want to make sure that I um, take the opportunity to just not only share my story, but share 
why I take so much pride in sharing my story and why I take so much pride in, in being able to be here with all of you today and the invitation to be here. Um, I was so thrilled to, to get this invitation. I was so thrilled to tell Melissa about this that you know, when, when um, Marissa Marshall, who works for Minding Your Mind, um, told me that this went through and we were able to present here, it was a, a incredibly motivating to hear and it's um, incredibly motivating to be here and to know that there are events like this. And so um, the last thing I'll say is just thank you. Um, thank you for being here, for being present, for listening to me, for allowing me to share, because um, it, it uh, means the world to me to still be able to do this. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for all that you do and for being vulnerable. Melissa, thank you so much for being here to represent as well. And um, we are so honored on the journey that you've had and that you're using your space and your ability to talk to others about your journey in mental health. And um, that's something, like you said, community-wise, we don't do often or rarely. So thank you so much for being bold enough. And Melissa, is there anything else you would like to add or tell us about the company? Yeah, so one thing that, uh, you know, I will say is um, when we are looking at individuals' experiences throughout their life and, and trying to develop skills um, to manage their mental health, I think when we look at, you know, the Black experience or the, you know, people of color's experience in this country, they're already starting out with a couple extra rocks in that backpack. We use like this backpack metaphor of everybody has their problems in their backpack. And there may be, you know, when we think about things, even just like microaggressions, just everyday things, it's like a thousand cuts. And we want to be able to balance validating that experience with also instilling that there's hope, you know, to be able to manage that and to move forward from that and to be resilient from that. Um, and I always want to balance that validation with that hope to overcome. Um, but that is real, you know, for people. And, and as you are counseling people um, within your community that are either a different race than you or maybe have different experiences of you, trying to balance that hope and that validation um, is one thing that I will say. And the other thing is just because I know it was asked in the beginning and I didn't mention it, but just to be clear, minding your mind, we are a nonprofit um, organization where we, our primary mission is to reduce stigma around mental health. And we know that stigma is large in entirety in this country, but especially in different pockets of different communities. Um, and so we know one out of four people will struggle with mental health at some point in their life, but only three out of 10 people will get the treatment that they deserve. And we know that that number is probably smaller for people in marginalized communities because of various barriers. Um, and so Minding Your Mind goes into communities, into schools, into corporate settings to try to give people resources, education, and validation about what they're going through. And so we're happy to give presentations and all different types of venues and at any kind of need, we also have specific presentations. So I just wanted to put that out there for future resources. Awesome, thank you so much. And just another thing, as a clinician, and I think you are a clinician, Melissa, yeah. how do you feel like storytelling like Jordan just did is important when it comes to mental health? So what a great question. We actually, um, our organization, Mind Your Mind, actually did our own research on this. We hooked up with the Scattergood um, company and did surveys. And we actually know from our research, but there's a plethora of research out there too about representation. But we know that when young adults go into schools, for example, and give their story, it actually decreases stigma and increases help-seeking behavior. What is help-seeking behavior? More likely to go to the counselors, more likely to go to an adult in their family and say, hey, I'm struggling. So we actually have the data to say exactly what you said, that a young adult speaker going in to a community is gonna increase those behaviors from our children and our teenagers. But I also think within the context of what we're speaking here, um, if based on culture or generational norms that things weren't talked about, um, how important it is to sort of break some of that stigma and break some of that um, previous generational differences in how we talk about mental health. And then also just to highlight um, Jordan's, I think um, coming home to that point that he was making about representation. You know, it's really hard to be if you cannot see, right? And so if you cannot see it, it's hard to be it. Um, and so the more that people, you know, can step up and represent for their people, whether it's culture, religion, race, you know, gender, um, LGBTQAI, 
it is so important. So I would just repeat this model as much as you can, whether it's with us or her different organization, for sure. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for uh, coming and sharing. We definitely put the information for Mining Your Mind into our chat. And we're just so honored that you all took time out your busy schedules to come be a part of this great platform. So thank you so much. And we're about to close. So 